get going. This is our 23rd lesson in our little journey through Ephesians. We are working with the Apostle Paul's letter to a church that has no real glaring deficiency. Um, before I get into the text tonight, I want to remind you of something I've kind of abandoned in this little journey, and that was we started, I tried to do a little bit from the front of the book and then a little bit from the back of the book to sort of show you how Paul gives you encouragement and then he gives you instruction and to show how when you get to the back of the book, it's kind of backloaded with instruction, like don't do this and do this. And that if you just went straight to the back of the book, you get an impression that Paul's, you know, he's kind of hard. He's got a lot of instructions, a lot of commands. Um, we did that for I, I, probably the first chapter. I think we were pretty consistent. And then sort of got into other things, and um, it, it, it slipped. I didn't really keep doing that. So I was thinking about that as I got into this, because we get into some pretty, you're starting to get into some pretty heady stuff you get in chapter 5. You're going to get into a bunch of don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. And it gets really sort of machine gun Stop that, stop that, stop that, which is not the, it's not fun preaching. It used to be, I used to love that stuff. It's like, don't do this, you know, whatever. But um, so as I was reading it today, I, I, it, st it struck me that what we need to be reminded of when you get to these passages are all of this stuff he's banked with his audience. You've guys, if you've got this in Christ, you're seated in heavenly places. The, it's by grace you're saved, not by works. You got all this bank, and then you got instruction. So don't lose sight of that. When we get into the instruction stuff, don't lose sight that he's built chapters of bank, grace bank, heavenly banking account, all this good stuff you've got in Christ that's in you now, not far off over in the glory land, present possession stuff. And then on the back side of that, you can tell people, hey, watch your lives, okay? Because you, this is what you have, this is what you're doing, Maybe what you're doing doesn't live up to what you have. And you can't go straight in, you can't go straight to the back of the letter and go, this is what's wrong with you guys without laying out what's right. And that's a very Pauline thing to do is lay out what's right and then go into some of the stuff that needs tweaked, that needs worked on. Because you know, quite frankly, what of us don't have something to work on? You know, and that's whether it's physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, our relationships, you got something you could fix if you could work on it, tweak it, you know, tighten it up a little bit. Um, Christians are no different. In fact, we're probably more cognizant of the things that we should work on because we are representatives of something bigger than ourselves. And I'm not talking about our country or our, even our family, but, but our God. And that's important. So I title this tonight, A Question, Why Christian Ethics? Um, because this is a Christian ethics passage. We're going to be in Ephesians 5 predominantly from verses, the, the real bulk of the oughts and what, what he wants you to stop doing starts in verse 3. We're going to start in verse 2 so that we ha kind of have a lead in. Um, and we're going to run that up through about verse 7 tonight. That's my goal. But I wanted to lay out a question that I, I'm not going to answer in the very beginning, but I want it to be that question that we work on as we go, and that is why Christian ethics. We're going to get into what that means, but I, I think it's important that we recognize that we do have an ethic as Christians. We do have this thing that defines us. We do have these things that define us in the way that we act, the way that we respond, the way that we govern ourselves in the world. Um, but in the light of grace, because my, my title was going to be, in the light of grace, why do ethics matter? Because I, I was just trying to think in practical terms. Like if Jesus finished the work, and God's not counting my sins against me. And grace is why I'm saved, not my performance. And my salvation is eternal in Christ, not temporal in me. Then what does it matter? You know, it's like, who cares what I do? It's like, why do I even need any kind of ethics if I'm going to win anyway? Like, I'm going to end up where I want to be in Christ. And I, I'm already in Christ, so what's it matter? Um, I thought the title might be kind of catchy. It might get somebody who's thinking in grace terms, but not thinking in performance terms or ethics terms to, to get on board. But really, the answer is you know, pretty simple. You don't need 45 minutes to try to figure out why it's important in the light of grace to have an ethical lifestyle if you care about anybody. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the simply put is if there's anybody you care about 
and there's anything you care about, ethics matter. Um, because if they don't, then you create. I, I'm a believer that you get the world you create. Okay? You can live in the world that's been created around you, but you ultimately get the world you create. So if you create a world of chaos and anger and hatred and you rip everybody off in your life, you get the hell you create. And, and it comes back to you. you and people call that karma. I call that consequences of your actions. Like you did this and then this happens to you. So, um, so it, it's, it is a question worth examining, but I want to do it in light of Scripture. So let's go to work on Ephesians 5. And I want to give you one lead-in verse that we did last week, which was verse 2. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We didn't really do much with sweet-smelling aroma last week. And it wasn't because there's not anything to do, but because we were on a journey to close this thing down. You'll recall, we had the last of four, and then we had the first two verses of five as a way to sort of shore up that thought Paul had. Um, because I didn't think it was a good chapter split. You had a therefore at the top of five. So we, we threw in two as a way to land it last week. Um, so let me just say this as we get started. Christ is the sweet-smelling aroma to God. This is a Hebrew term that would have evoked the memories of sacrificial systems. That the, it, the belief was that the smell of the burning flesh on the altar appeased, and I'm going to use a, a pagan term here, appeased the gods, all right, small g, because that's the way the world at large felt. Sacrifices appease the gods. So the Hebrews come along and they start getting the instruction for the temple, and the, ta the tabernacle and the temple, and they, they have this incense, this sweet-smelling incense that's ground in private. You couldn't make the ingredients at home. If you get caught trying to make the ingredients in your tent, you were excommunicated. You were killed. I mean, it was a, it was a secret event, a smell reserved only for the God of gods. The Hebrews had it. And so it went into the incense uh, lantern in the tabernacle and they would wave it in the worship space. You take a coal off the altar, you put it in, you pour this sweet smelling incense over, and it, it just fills the, the smoke, would roll out of the temple as a sweet smelling savior. And the, only the God of Hebrews had it because it was a unique scent. So Paul's sort of playing on that a little bit, going, now Christ is the sweet smell. And by making Christ the sweet smell, that means that there's no more lambs, bulls, goats, pigeons, turtle doesn't need to die. But more specifically, there's no more you need to do. God's not sniffing the air to see if you're living right. That's kind of a, a crude illustration to say God's not peeking into your lives to go, hmm, things don't smell right in here. Somebody's not living right. And that's an easy trap to get in. In our faith is believing that we have a God who's always sort of peering over, you know, uh, and to keep with the illustration, sort of sniffing the air, going, something's not, something's not right. Some, something's burning. You know, someone's not living right. And yet, that's kind of the God we, we think we have. And it's the God many of us preach. And it's the God we're scared of. And it's the God we present sort of carrot in front of the donkey to people to try to get them to live right. Paul's about to give you, because you're going to, you see the turn in three, where he goes, but fornication all unclean. So you know we're going we're to make a sharp left right here where Paul goes, Christ is the sweet smelling savior, but stop doing this and this and this and this. So it'd be really easy right here. If you're going to go on this list of stuff to avoid, stick that carrot in front of the donkey, man. And go, hey, God's got some stuff he demands out of you. But he doesn't. Instead, he leads into the instruction with, Christ is the sweet-smelling aroma before God. In other words, no matter what you do, it doesn't turn God's face repulsed by the smell of you or by the sight of you or by the sound of you. And this, this has echoes of the Garden of Eden where Adam sins and he knows he's naked and so he covers himself and he hides in the bushes and here comes God. Hey, Adam, where are you? Oh, uh, I'm hiding in the bushes. Why are you hiding in the bushes? I was naked. Who told you you were naked? And Adam's got the idea that there's a God that's peering into the garden and something ain't right. And so that's sort of been the, the story of the Bible then is us trying to get to that place where we understand the relationship that we have with God. So Paul really lays it out. Hey, it's Christ that's the sacrifice. It's Christ that's the sweet smelling room. It's not you. It's Christ. But fornication, uncleanliness, covetousness, let it not even be named among you as 
is fitting for the saints. So I want to take the, the walk in love right after the conjunction and, the top of verse 2. Walk in love, and then you get, but don't live this way. Why? Walk in love as Christ loved. Real thought is, how did Christ love? Or not just how did Christ love, that's part of it. Who did Christ love? Well, he loved the unworthy. He loved people who didn't earn it. He showed that love by doing no violence to anyone. That's a, that's a thought that has really been alive in me lately. I'm trying to pay attention to Jesus in the Gospels. So what does Jesus, how does he navigate the world? He does no violence by anyone. And I don't mean punching them in the face. Of course he doesn't do that. I was in John 2 this morning reading, and Jesus fashions a whip. And he's knocking over money changers' tables. I'm reading David Bentley Hart's footnotes. And he goes, it's very evident in the Greek that Jesus specifically hits only objects, not people. And I thought, that was a cool way, pretty much kind of a cool way to lay that out. Like, the Greek takes great pains in that moment to show Jesus is only knocking over things. It's incredible that in his angriest moment on the earth, Jesus does no violence to people. So, so yes, for sure. Jesus navigates the world without punching people in the face. <laughs> that's, that's not, but that's not even the violence I'm talking about. He doesn't do violence to people's character. He doesn't do violence to people's trust. He doesn't do violence to people's faith. He doesn't manipulate them. He doesn't you know, lead them by the nose. He doesn't lead them by the wallet. Uh, he doesn't blackmail them. He doesn't hold their works over their head. He doesn't withhold healing from people because they've sinned. He, and we get all these stories where, hey, your sins are forgiven you. The guy's a paralytic. Your sins are forgiven you. Obviously, your sins have put you there. I'll heal you of your sickness in a minute, but I want to start with what's really wrong with you. And that's the Jesus that we see. I um, was doing a DDP today in Mark, and I'm in that moment where Jesus pulls a child up and puts the kid on his knee. There's actually two moments in Mark. There's one in Mark 9, and there's one in Mark 10. So I was in the Mark 10 version, because the Mark 9 version is Jesus is about to lead into this story on hell. It's an interesting lead in, but the Mark 10 version is some parents bring their kids to Jesus and the disciples try a little end around because Jesus just told them, don't offend the kids. Be better for a millstone, be put around your neck, thrown in the sea. So the parents bring kids up and the disciples don't rebuke the kids because they were just warned about offending kids. So they rebuke the parents. Tricky religion. We're always tricky. And so they rebuke the parents and Jesus takes the kid, puts him on his knee and goes, unless you become as one of these little kids, you don't inherit the kingdom. You don't get in. And so we spent a little time on the DDP going, what does Jesus mean? You can't get, it's, it can't be that you can only get into the kingdom if you get saved as a kid, because the rest of the New Testament are adults getting saved. Like there are adults getting baptized or adults getting converted. What's the point if you can't get in the kingdom anyway, unless you're a kid? Well, of course that's not it. But it's also not just an attitude. Like you gotta be innocent and you know, a little round face and trust mom and dad, you get in the kingdom. But it's the, the lowest, it's the loser. It's the little kids, the lowest, you know, it's, they're the life little losers. And, and, and we don't see that in our world because kids are sort of the top of the rung. In the ancient world, they were the bottom of the rung. And this really didn't change until the Industrial Revolution. Um, I was reading an old 19th century economist the other day who was praising the advent of factories. And he said one of the most exciting things about this new technology is it provides reasonable employment for three-year-olds. And that was written, that was like a published paper for the good reasons we have factories. They went, we have a safe space for three-year-olds to work. And so I, I was thinking, gosh, can you imagine today that even getting said, much less printed, much less, here's the three-year-old department. You know, these kids are all pulling yarn or something, I don't know. Uh, point being, for a lot of our history, um, kids were just the, they were two more hands that could work in the house, but they were the worst workers. They ate the most, they produced the least, and they were the low end of the social stratum. So here Jesus puts one on his knee and goes, unless you become like this, you make it into the kingdom. He didn't mean unless you become innocent. He meant unless you get to the place where you realize you have nothing to offer. That's when you qualify. When you come to God and go, this is me. No pride, no self, it's just me and then you get in. Well, that's who Jesus loves. And Jesus puts that kid on his knee and blesses him. And so, if that's how Jesus loved, and that's who Jesus loved, then when we love like Jesus, we don't, 
We don't love based on the resume. We don't love based on the income. We don't love based on the neighborhood. We don't love based on the religion or the, all the stuff that's so easy for us to do. And that's all, Jesus, that's all Paul's asking. If Jesus smells right to the Father, then go out and present that aroma to the world and then know what that would look like. That's why you got to study Jesus. And when we do, we learn he didn't do violence to anybody he, who he loved. Everything listed that we are to avoid, these things represent the opposite of love. So keep that in mind. So you go through this list. It's not just an arbitrary list of God going, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. You guys are having fun doing this. I don't want you to do that anymore. But all of these things provide violence in one way or the other, either to yourself or to your neighbor in a way that a loving father can't stand idly by. Even though grace has saved you, even though you're righteous, even though you're a son or a daughter, a loving father, a loving parent can't stand idly by and go, yeah, you know what, go ahead and kill yourself. I don't care. We wouldn't do that to anybody we love. We wouldn't do to our own kids. We wouldn't say, you know, it doesn't matter. I love you anyway. If you want to kill yourself doing stupid things, do stupid things. No, we, we, can't, we don't stop them all the time, but we certainly have to lay some things out there. So that, that's part of it. Um, what's the cause? What is the cause for Christian ethics? I want, to put some, I want to put a few reasons why. This is certainly not some sort of master class on Christian ethics, but what is the reason that we have a list of ethics? Um, First of all, let me just start with the idea that we seem infatuated with commands and not as impressed with ethics. So like, I don't see anybody lobbying Congress to put the Beatitudes up in public schools, but we sure are fighting for the Ten Commandments. And what I think is a, and I, and I wanna make it clear here that I don't think that the public schools should put up the Beatitudes either. I'm actually a proponent of the separation of church and state. Um, a true proponent because the church always loses, by the way. <laughs> when you put the church with the empire of any ilk, the church loses. If you've never read Revelation, read it through that lens. Okay, I'll leave that alone. But it is an interesting moral issue to me that we would get really excited about a list of don'ts but you don't see anyone lobbying for blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the, those who mourn. No one's looking for the ethics of the kingdom as spoken by Jesus. We're not, we're not encouraging people to, if your neighbor bids you to carry the load a mile, carry it for him too. If they smite you on the cheek, turn to them the other one. But we sure do love thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not um, as a system of morality because part of that is Part of that's grandstanding and posturing. Let's just be honest. I mean, that, that's, that might be 90% of it. But the other 10%, I, I kind of think, has to do with the idea that we think that if people had a list of commands, they'd live better. Well, how'd that work out? You got an entire Old Testament to show you that that didn't work. You could put a list of commands on people, and they don't suddenly figure out, oh, wait a minute, I should be doing better. And so Paul doesn't resort to the Ten Commandments. But he does lay out a list of ethics, and so I believe that it's important for us to understand what those ethics are about because they matter. To me, Christian ethics are different than business ethics or the ethics of the systems of the world. You can go to college, you'll take a business, you go to business school, you'll take business ethics, the things you should do, the things you shouldn't do, and the things that are, uh, and they almost always rotate around bottom lines, profits, customers, capital, income. Um, they don't rotate around love. No one has a business ethics class that rotates around love. Why would they? That's not the ethic of business. The ethic of business is making money. Uh, you can say whatever you want about what your, your priority is, but that's the bottom line. Um, but, our, but as an, an ethic of a believer, why bother? So let me go back to our first question. If grace is grace, and I'm saved by grace, I'm righteous, he took my sin, I take his righteousness. That's it inexorable fact can't be taken away from me. I'm secure in Christ. What does it matter if I have Christian ethics? Because I'm going to heaven anyway. I'm righteous anyway. I am one of the sons of God anyway. Um, who cares what I do? I think that question is as terrible as this question, which gets asked constantly by Christians. And I think this is a horrible one. Well, if there's any hope 
that Jesus cleans hell out someday and everybody gets a chance to go to heaven anyway. Why should we tell anybody about Jesus and why bother following Jesus? And I have people ask me that question every time I even hint that there's a chance that Jesus goes to work on those people in hell. And a Christian will raise their hand and go, well, then what's the point? And I don't think we realize how how much we are in love with the idea of pagan living. <laughs> like, oh, so if I thought I could make it home, gosh, I'd quit this church stuff and living for God and reading the word and praying. I've got a bunch of stuff I'd like to go try. And I've just started telling people, well, just go knock yourself out, man. I mean, whatever it is you think is so good that you've laid down for king and cause, go give it a shot and see what it does to you. I just I want to warn you that when you throw that boulder in the water, there are waves, okay? And all of your houses you've built are about to get slammed by those waves. But it's but your boulder. You're really excited about it. Chuck that baby and, and just, you know, watch for the fallout because it's coming. And don't blame God and say he's mad at you and heaven's trying to teach you a lesson. Just realize that you get the hell you create. And if you want it, you can have all of it because, man, there's a bunch of it out there. Because evil's not some ontological thing. It's just you rejecting love. And you can reject that all day long and evil will just be in its wake. Um, so for me, it's, it's a matter of, my Christian ethic links me, separates me, joins me, but none of it saves me. So why have it at all? Okay, well, here's a few reasons. Again, not a master class, but some highlights. Christian ethics link us to each other. I don't just mean this room, though it does. I mean, we, we all got some sort of some common things that we identify in our ethic. It's why we sit in the same room together. It's really difficult to share too much time with people don't share your ethics. I mean, I don't, I don't mean you can't eat with them. I don't mean you can't hang out with them, but it's difficult to really share your heart with people that don't share your ethics. Like if they want to cheat all the time and they want to rip you off, it's tough to hang out with somebody who's <laughs> you constantly got to be on the lookout for the knife, you know, the, and they think that's the way you get through life. Strong survive. And you're like, you know, I, I don't want to get run over every time I'm around this person. So maybe I avoid them. So it's difficult to maintain the ethic where you don't agree. So yes, in this room, it links us to each other. But I'm way, it's way bigger than that. Because a Christian ethic that revolves around loving like Jesus links believers all over the world. It links them regardless of what country they live in, regardless of what tongue they have, regardless of their skin, regardless of their church, high church, low church, strip mall church, cathedral church. The ethic that links them is not songs and testimonies and liturgy or the way they preach, but the way they live. And so what links us in those is that if you can, you know that if you can find someone who knows Christ, there's a certain set of stuff you can expect out of them. And the church is at its best, I think, when those things are so recognizable by non-believers. If I can just find a Christian, I'll find someone with charity. I'll find someone with love. I'll find someone who will help me. That's, on, that's under attack now in our culture. Because I wonder sometimes if our ethic hasn't become so much about um, not about linking us together and, and commonality around Christ, but around other things. That's one I want to say for a moment. So they link us to each other. There's a lot we could say there, but for brevity's sake, we'll leave it. You work on that in your own mind. Uh, Christian ethics separate us from the ethic of the world because the ethic of the world sometimes revolves around the dollar. It re revolves around get ahead. It revolves around get all you can. Um, uh, well... There's all kinds of them, but in Christ, it separates us from the things of the world. And it's the very reason why in Ephesians 5, Paul goes, don't look like this. This is the kind of stuff the world does. Why would you do it? You're not of them. And so you go, well, what? if you're back on that, well, grace saves me. And so what does it matter? Then we're ignoring the fact that there's an ethic of the world and there's an ethic of Christ and they don't look alike. And so living the ethic of Christ separates us from the system of the world, sets us apart. And then this one, and this to me is the biggie. Christian ethics are reflective of Christ's love. They, they really do show the world that there is something worth living and dying for. 
more than the materialism. And that leads to this thought, because for me, and this is where I almost got ahead of myself a second ago, but that leads to this thought. When your Christian ethics come to represent, quote unquote, Christian, more than they represent Christ, abandon those Christian ethics. This is the inherent danger of a collective ethic. And what I mean by this thought, and it's probably poorly worded, so let me work on it a little bit. What we believe and how we live are supposed to be reflections of Christ. They don't save us. They are just reflections of how saved we are. Let's maybe say it that way. Um, However, when those ethics become more about categorizations than they do about loving like Jesus, abandon them. We have whole categories of ethics. This has become a very politically charged topic, ethics. Okay? Because there's the ethics of the right in American politics, and there's the ethics of the left in the American politics. And if you lean to the right, you find the ethics of the right compatible with your leanings. And if you lean to the left, you find the ethics of the left compatible with your leanings. Of course you do. It's your side. <laughs> that's, that's your ethic. When those ethics start to become about what it means to be Christian, not what it means to love like Christ, be careful. Because the ethic could turn into looking nothing like Christ and looking everything like Christians. Progressive Christians, conservative Christians, left-leaning Christians, Right-leaning Christians. They, it may have a little bit to do with a, a thing Jesus said, but nothing to do with the way Jesus loved. And yet, we've started to embrace them as Christian ethics. I think, in fact, we've embraced some things that have so little to do with Christ, but they have a lot to do with the church. Like they identify us as a certain kind of believer, and therefore I'd rather embrace that because that tells people what I am. And that's allowing the ethic to sort of speak for you. So you can identify by a flag or a political color or a bumper sticker what you don't have to live out then. So you can kind of be whatever you want to be as long as you fall under the umbrella of a certain Christian ethic on all different kinds of the spectrum, politically, socially, nationally. It's a dangerous place. It's not where the people of Christ belong. Not under some collective umbrella of ethics, but under that which looks like and loves like Jesus. I'm going to give you an example of one that I think is in the text that, if we're not careful, can show itself in our life. Here was that third verse isolated. Fornication and all uncleanness or or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Okay, it seems pretty straightforward. Your saints... You're, that's a done deal. So th- this isn't making you a saint. All right? You're already saints. He's the sweet smell, not you. Forget it. You can't be the sweet smell. You're not sweet enough. Christ, sweet smell and savor. But I still don't want to see fornication, uncleanness, and covenants. That's not the stuff people need to know you by. That's not how you identify saints is by that stuff. So, okay, so you don't lose your sainthood by these. You don't, you don't more save, less save by doing them. So what's the... Why bother? Well, interestingly enough, when we start to talk ethics, we almost always go to the other. That's where we, like, the stuff you shouldn't do, we go pick the stuff other people are doing, and that's sort of first. And so we really gravitate to stuff like verse 3, because in reality, in the Greek, it's really more sexual impurity, just sort of rampant lusts. And so we're kind of cool with that and go, yeah, tell them. Really, I mean, because it's always other people. They're way more lustful than us and way more sexually impure. And you know what? You're probably right. I mean, because there's, you know, there's a lot of sexual impurity. And um, benefit of the doubt, you're probably not involved in the worst of sexual impurities because we could come up with a pretty tawdry list. I mean, pr- probably pretty easily. But if you're not careful, you will miss that Paul... And I think, the, I think the fact that we've translated covetousness for so long the way we have, it's kind of an old dead word. I think we miss the fact that nestled right in there with sort of sexual impurity is a very, very, very Americanized Christian ethic in Ephesians 5.3. You go, because 
you read covetousness and you can always figure, well, yeah, I probably got a little bit of that, but it's not so bad. Because the problem with covetousness is, is you, you know, people need to be balanced. That's what we'll say. People, we need to be balanced. You just don't need to get, you don't need to get covetous. You got to work hard. You got to try to get what's yours, but you don't want to get lustful. You don't just want to get too much. Um, let's work on that word just a little bit. I just want to show you a Christian ethic that uh, maybe isn't so Christ, maybe more Christian than Christ. Covetousness is from the Greek word pleonexia. Pleonexia is literally de the desire to have more. So, uh, you know, 400 years ago, we used the English word covetousness because you want more stuff. David Bentley Hart, I, I consider Hart the modern Greek genius. His New Testament translation translates this more accurately as the word acquisitive, which doesn't help at all because most of us would have to look that word up. However, acquisitive means excessively interested in acquiring money or material things. And I see this as a point of pride within the Western world because technically, acquisitiveness is part of the Western ethic. Get as much as you can. This is what your whole business scheme is, this is what your whole plan is, what your whole life is, what your whole checkbook is, it's what your whole life is. I say the Western world because, and, and, and has the church, has the Western church benefited from financial largesse and success? <laughs> of course, <laughs> yeah. craziness. Of course we've benefited. <laughs> and I mean, the fact that you can sit and watch this is a benefit of success. And the technological world has been advanced by the Western world. So the fact you can sit at home and watch this or watch this on a smartphone developed in the Western world is definitely a part of it. So I'm not, I'm not certainly not trying to knock success and, and, and us doing well. But a Christian ethic is not always a Christ ethic. It should be, but it has become very Christian to do better. In fact, one of the things that's hijacked the grace message that I love is the prosperity gospel. Has hijacked it to the point that now if you're a grace preacher, you're probably a prosperity preacher, which just me. And I know the snarky comment is, well, what would be the opposite? Being a poor preacher? I get it. It's easy to be snarky. But the reality is, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not an invitation to wealth. It's not an invitation to doing great. <laughs> it's why he puts a child on his knee. He goes, this is how you get in. And you're not promised that when you come in as this child, you come out as like ruler of the world. I mean, I seat you in heavenly places with me, but this isn't a guarantee for fat wallets and big 401k accounts if you follow Jesus. Now, there are wealthy people that follow Jesus. There were wealthy people that followed Jesus in the word. In the, in the New Testament, and perhaps even some of his own followers, like intimate followers. But Jesus makes it a point of his ministry to turn to the outsider, to turn to the downtrodden, to turn to the hurting, to turn to the poor. And then when Paul picks up the whole gospel message and trumpets it to the world, at the top of his list of like, look, one of our ethics is we don't have to spend our lives in hoarding and acquiring. Now, I only bring this up because I just want to show us that it's easy when we start listing off stuff to find everybody else. But we're all right here. All of us are here. I mean, we're probably in all of them, but this is one that is pretty evident. And so what do we do with it? We have to always, all of us have to just take this to the Lord. Is that, Lord, I want to learn contentness. I want to know what it looks like. And I want to be able to walk in it. And I want to express it because it's part of who I am in Christ. Uh, go, let's, go back to the, let's go back to the next two. And I, we're not gonna, I'm not going to work hard on every single one of these. I, I just want to give you an overview. Neither filthiness or foolish talking or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving. Honestly, we don't even know what Paul means on some of these. Like it's really hard to figure out what, why is Paul so mad about coarse jesting? You know, like what's, what ticks him off so bad about people? Um, uh, apparently the coarseness of it might have been getting out of hand. Um, but so I, I'm not, I don't try to justify nor knock any of these. I, I'm, 
I do believe that we're dealing with some things in time and place. So Paul has a first century church. There's some stuff going on. It's not fitting for Christians. I even love that phrase, which are not fitting. So whatever they are, they're just not fitting for the environment that they're in for the Christ that they serve. I do also think this is an interesting phrase at the end of verse 4. What's the contrast of filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting, and not fitting? Give thanks. And that's not say thank you. The Greek word for thanksgiving is Eucharist. So, coded or not, this is a communion verse. So Paul's like, look, you can go live like the world, do all this stuff, but we're communion people. We feast on the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time we do it, we're thankful. And so I think in Ephesians 5 right here, Paul is laying out yet again another case for communion amongst the saints. If you were concentrating more on the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus in your meetings, rather than, it kind of feels like he's like, all this stupidity you're doing. He goes, if you lay some of that aside and then get to communion, you know, we'd look more reflective of Christ. For this you know, verse 5, no fornicator, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So let me, let me deal with this because this is the kind of thing that puts a full stop on people. It's like they're doing really good. Jesus is the smell. I'm not the sweet smell before God. I'm not not supposed to be living like this because it's not fitting of the saints. I don't look like Jesus. Great. Okay, so I don't want to live that way. And then all of a sudden, fornicators, unclean persons, covenants, man, they don't have an inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and God. And we read that as, if you've done any of these things, you're not going to heaven. Okay, well, first of all, you can tell by the way we read it, something's wrong because it doesn't sound anything like that. So that's your first hint that you might be interpolating your own Christian theology onto an ancient text. Okay. Almost never are Jesus and Paul talking about a post-mortem heaven. They're almost always introducing you to the life of God that you can have now. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God was not perceived to be something offered in the glory land that you could get someday when you died. Out of the lips of Jesus, it was something you could have if you just started to change your mind. As you repent, you could step into the kingdom. And Paul just told you to take communion, which is the kingdom diet. Body broken, blood shed. Paul goes, if you're taking that in, okay? Here's what you already know. A fornicator, an unclean person, a covetous person, an idolater, they don't have an inheritance like you do. See, you are not these things, but you're acting like it. That's been the whole point of this passage. You're not a fornicator, so quit committing fornication. You're not an unclean person, so stop doing things unclean people are doing. You're not a covetous person, so stop being so greedy. He goes, because you know that those kind of people, they don't walk in the kingdom. They walk in this natural realm. They're not inheritors of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He does a very similar thing to the Corinthian church where he hammers away at several different things. And then he says this to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord by the Spirit of our God. So you're not what you are doing. And here's what I like to remind Christians of when going to places. You, listen, I, didn't, I don't come into your church to preach all the stuff you're doing wrong. You're probably smart enough to know you're doing a bunch of stuff wrong. What I do come in here to tell you is you are not everything you're doing. You are more than the sum of what you are doing. So maybe it's time to start doing what you are. Like, you're not a fornicator. You're not an idolatry. You, you're, a, you're a citizen of the kingdom. You're not that other stuff. So what danger is there in acting like you are? <sighs> it's pretty evident. I mean, remember that big boulder we talked about, throwing in your life and watching all the way? Yeah, that's, that's the evidence of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can do that anytime you want to. It doesn't lessen who you are in Christ but sure does make it difficult to convince people you're that in Christ. And you know what it does to her and to him? It makes it more difficult for them to tell anybody who they are in Christ because they serve the same Jesus you do. 
And so it's kind of like what we said last week, because people matter. It's the same general thing. It's just Paul sort of ratcheted it up a little bit to say, here's some of the stuff we're involved in, but it's not what we are. And I want to remind all of you, you are more than what you do. You have been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of God. You used to be these things. You may still be doing them, but you need to ask yourself why. Why are you doing them? And I'll go back to what I said earlier. If you're not doing them because you're afraid um, of going to hell, then I don't think you've ever really met Jesus. I know you said the sinner's prayer. You got baptized. You joined a church. You might even be pastoring. But I don't know if you've met Jesus. Because in meeting Jesus, you've met the one for whom your soul longs. And it doesn't have perfect love casts out fear. So you don't follow him out of fear any longer. Um, what will we do when perfect love really takes over if the only reason we're living for God's fear? Um, I kind of think it's the closet reason why we're scared to preach the love of God in the church. Because we're afraid somebody will get it. And perfect love will cast out fear. And if those people stop being afraid, well, then what are we going to do with them? And, and, and so it's this release into who you are, not who you aren't. So the encouragement is to start living who you are. Let's go back do two more verses. Verse 6 and 7, close this down tonight. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with him. Let me hit for about the 10th time in the last 10 weeks just a little bit on the wrath of God, okay? Um, good opportunity to do so because we're two days removed from Pentecost. Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, the day that for 2,000 years the church has celebrated the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Technically, on the liturgical calendar, it was the close of the Christian Holy Year. You start at Advent and you work your way to Pentecost. You start anticipating the birth of Christ and then the arrival of the Holy Spirit inside of the natural temple called the church. Um, from this point on, we kind of go into the summer months in America and we go into what's, you know, go into common time. Um, and then we're going to start it all back up again when we get back to Advent at the end of the year. But um, it's been about six months of our actual lunar year. We celebrate in the Christian calendar that journey from the anticipation of Christ all the way up until the arrival of the Spirit. But that's Christians. If you're Jewish, um, Shabbat it was Sinai. Pentecost was the moment they had called Pentecost. That's a Christian thing to do. That's a Greek thing to do. Shabbat was the moment when the fire fell at Sinai and God gave them the law. And it happened 50 days after the Passover, 50 days after they left Egypt. God, they put the blood on the door. The angel of death saw the blood pass over. And then 50 days later, they find themselves at the mountain that is dark, where the fire falls on the mountain. And at the bottom of the mountain, 3,000 people are killed by the sword of vengeance. And then, 50 days after the death of Christ, 10 days after Jesus ascends into heaven, ascension, the Holy Spirit falls at Shavuot, and it is now Pentecost, 50 days after. And when the fire falls at Pentecost, 3,000 people are converted. 3,000 people die when the fire falls at Sinai as a type that under the performance of the law, you will die. 3,000 people are saved, or you could say this, 3,000 people are resurrected at Sinai. Because the fire that falls at Pentecost is the fire that renews. But here is the real catch. This, to me, is the catch of the gospel in regards to the wrath of God. It's the same fire. God doesn't change. The fire that falls at Sinai is the fire that falls at Pentecost. It's just that the fire that falls at Sinai falls on a world of performance, where the sword is in the hand. And in a world of performance where the sword is in the hand, the wrath of God consumes you because you have presented yourself to God. And the fire that falls, falls on the sons, that's family, 
This is God turning into his own people. On the sons of disobedience, those who hold the sword up in front of God, the fire falls and destroys them. Same fire at Pentecost, but they are a people who are placing faith in the Jesus Peter's preaching on that portico there in Pentecost. And by placing faith in Jesus, and they're all baptized, and 3,000 of them go down into the water and come up saved. It's the same fire, but it's the fire of God received that transforms them. The wrath of God is simply the fire of His love that you should receive that you refuse to receive. And you put your own works and your own performance and your own self up against it, and you fall down and die. Something in us falls down. Here's the truth. Let's take it to the next step. Peel the onion back. 3,000 people died at Sinai. 3,000 people died at Pentecost. It was just that the death that happened at Pentecost was death to the old man and 3,000 new creations raised up out of the water. Because the reality is that something dies when it goes into the fire. That's what fire does. You go into the fire, something dies. It's just if you go into the fire of his love, trusting him, a new you comes out. We stop with this thought. Don't live under the law as the sons of disobedience do. The fire that brings rebirth is the love of God at Pentecost. Those that fashion a God in their own image, well, then it's the fire of wrath. And that's really what happens at Sinai. They make a cow out of their own gold. It's the God that they can see. And they put it up as if it's God. And the fire of God's love burns that thing. Moses burns it to ash, puts it in the water, makes them drink it. Um, there's some depth there. We'll leave it alone. But... Um, don't run from Ephesians 5, 7, 6, and 7. You get to the wrath of God on the sons of disobedience. God's wrath is, is not to punish you. God's wrath is just God's love spurned. And it doesn't have to fall on you as wrath, but it still falls on you as fire. All of us are salted with fire. Pentecost shows us that the fire of God has always been the same. It's just our, we receive it differently. Sinai's fire can be received as Pentecost's fire. Um, so why Christian ethics? Maybe last week's title, because people matter. But also because you matter. And because the fire is doing its work in you. Let's pray. And let's just ask the Lord to do this in us. Just each of us, to begin this work in us. And all the listeners and all the viewers, I ask you to do the same thing wherever you can, however you can. Father, I just thank you. I thank you again that this all comes back around. Every time we open this where we start talking, we end up right back at Jesus. That's a beautiful thing to me. It just kind of takes us full circle. We take this journey and then, boom, we end up right back with Christ. Uh, I don't care so much for an ethic defined by the church or Christianity at large. I want it to look like Christ. Where it's called Christian ethics and looks like Christ, then God, teach me how to walk in it because it matters. It matters to me and the quality of life that I have, and it matters to my neighbor. Th those ethics, God, that don't look like Christ and they just look like posturing, I don't need them. And show me where they are taking precedence in my own life so I can put them in the fire of your love. We thank you for this. Teach us to walk this out in Jesus' name. Amen.